presentation up here, so you're all set with that. Do you have any virtual speakers? In general, high proportion is for the yeah, we have the information. Okay, cool. All right. All right, you're welcome. Very cool. People checking the last thing. There are still, I hope. So they don't look for no <laughs> They don't have to connect. There is no. They don't hear. I mean, they just, like they don't understand if they are in the wrong. I'm in that group. I'm in that group. I'm telling you, those people are really very nice. <laughs> but they know that. Right, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Ye
So just to give you a bit of an overview about what we're going to be discussing today, um, we're going to receive an opening statement by Dr. Daniel Eibach, who's joining us virtually. Um, Dr. Eibach is a clinician or was a clinician at the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Tübingen in Germany. He's worked for MSF in Liberia and completed his training in tropical medicine um, at the Mango University in Bangkok. He specialized in microbiology, virality, and infectious epi epidemiology, and was a fellow in the European Program for Public Health Microbiology in New York. He has also worked um, at the Danat Noft Institute for Tropical Medicine in Hamburg and um, for seven years and headed the research group for bacterial genomics and AMR. Since 2020, he is a senior policy officer for One Health, AMR, and entities at the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, next, I will be giving a brief introduction to One Health, and I'll introduce myself a little bit more in detail afterwards. And then afterwards, we'll um, look at a short video of an example of washing schools in Zambia, um, after which we'll proceed to an input on entities and washing schools from Dr. Belisario. Uh, Dr. Bonzario is a professor and former dean of the College of Public Health, University of the Philippines in Manila, and he is an adjunct of a professor of global health at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, and he currently serves as a member of the scientific working group Research Capacity Strengthening with UNICEF, UNIT, World Bank, and WHO Special Program for Research and Training in Tropical Diseases. He is a physician specialized in, in tropical medicine and public health. And amongst many other posts, he's also served as under secretary of the Department of Health of the Republic of the Philippines. His academic work includes research on control and prevention of neglect of tropical diseases, malaria, tuberculosis, health systems, and research capacity and strengthening. After this, we'll have another short video um, from a example of for school implementation now. And then we will have an input on gaps and challenges by Chrissy Chaki. Uh, who is an associate professor of engineering at Fort Lewis College and a WASH consultant. She's been working on WASH monitoring and evaluation since 2009 with a strong focus on WASH in school and has worked with the WHO UNICEF, UNICEF joint monitoring program since 2009. Um, after that, we'll proceed to a panel discussion where we'll also be joined by Michael Nuno. Uh, who is a WASH specialist based in New York and supports the UNICEF sanitation and hygiene program, WASH in schools, and mental health and hygiene. He's in WASH team's focal point, he's the WASH team's focal point for the linkages and nutrition team at UNICEF headquarters. He started his career as a medical doctor and public health practitioner. He has extensive background knowledge in development work and emergency preparedness and response with the UN, NGOs, government, and academia. All right, so let's get into it. Um, I will try to share the screen. Voila, I hope you can. There we go. Dr. Iba, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nadia. Can you hear me well? Yes, fantastic, thank you. Okay, perfect. Yeah, uh, dear colleagues, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the side event uh, convened by the GIZ on behalf of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, in short, um, BMZ. Um, I think this conference provides really a great opportunity to share insights and exchange lessons learned about this vital interconnection between WASH and neglected tropical diseases, and of course the role of One Health. I think we should use this opportunity to co connect policymakers and practitioners, researchers across all these sectors uh, to discuss on more effective um, measures to improve um, public health. Um, our ministry, the BMZ, um, strives to strengthen health systems uh, and reduce disease burden through international development cooperation. And amongst different health topics, we consider it highly important to shine a spotlight on these 20 very diverse diseases that are classified as NTDs by the WHO, as this, these diseases predominantly affect the poorest of the poor, and they affect impoverished and marginalized communities. And this is why our work on entities is 
centered on our understanding to use holistic and intersectoral approaches. We strongly encourage efforts for better collaboration between environmental, environment, animal health, and human health sector. This is what we call One Health. And this One Health approach is also an integral part of, this, of the WHO Roadmap 2030 to end the neglect um, of NTDs. Um, in my opinion, concerning the international health architecture, um, we are moving into the right direction already. There is closer collaboration of the quadripartite organizations, namely the Food and Agriculture Organization, the United Nations Environmental Program, the World Health Organization, and the um, World Organization for Animal Health as well as the um, establishment of the One Health high-level expert panel. I think those, those are great steps leading to better international and intersectoral collaboration in this field. Um, concerning the German development cooperation, um, we have a long history of engagement in multilateral and bilateral entity programs. Um, we have supported, for example, the WHO Special Program for Research and Training in Tropical Diseases, and TDR, for more than half a century now, since the early 70s. And we are currently also supporting the um, WHO-led expanded special programs for elimination of NTDs, ESPEN. And yeah, other examples are um, regional projects on NTDs in Central Africa, where we adopt a One Health approach right now. And we have um, local level capacity building um, projects uh, like the um, hospital partnership program, which improves um, more the diagnostic and, and treatment um, sectors. And we have a couple of intersectoral rabies control projects um, in Cambodia, in Cameroon, and uh, in, in Namibia as well. Um, one thing all those projects have in common uh, is the multitude of stakeholders from civil society, academia, and as well the private sector. Um, to demonstrate the commitment of the German government to the, for the fight against NTDs, um, we were uh, the first donor country who signed up the Kigali Declaration on NTDs earlier this year. So where is the link now between um, WASH and NTDs? Um, the BMZ considers WASH as an elementary prerequisite for health and sees WASH as an integral component of this One Health approach. Um, safe and adequate WASH plays a key role in preventing NTDs. Many of them are caused by inadequate WASH provisions. So we need access to clean water, we need sufficient sanitation facilities, we need possibilities to wash our hands. Um, this is vital uh, to combat entities. And this is also reflected in our One Health strategy, which was launched in 2021, which, um, in which uh, WASH is uh, one of the focus activities. I think on the positive side, the importance of WASH um, has gained a lot of visibility during the COVID-19 pandemic recently. But on the other hand, on the downside, the focus on COVID-19 has unfortunately led to further neglect of diseases such as entities, uh, with these um, being largely left out of COVID-19 interventions. Um, the BMZ commitment extends equally to water and wastewater sector. We are currently funding more than 360 projects in the water sector. And our work in this field spans a broad portfolio. We support projects uh, on the protection of water resources and aquatic ecosystems, as well as, as, well as development of infrastructure and services for clean water. And um, I think during this event today, we want to showcase more practical examples of the implementation of a One Health approach. Specifically, uh, you will hear more about um, our WASH activities carried out in school settings. And the BMZ supported uh, the implementation of these activities um, through regional fit for school programs, that's how we call it. And they run since 2011. 
And here, this interdisciplinary and intersectoral approaches are put in practice um, with implementing evidence-based and uh, scalable interventions in the ed education sector. So um, we have seen that as yet much more to be done. Yeah? Both WASH and NTD's initiatives would greatly benefit from further intersectoral collaboration. And I think this is why we are here for today. Um, we highly appreciate this interdisciplinary learning, learning and exchange opportunities uh, like this conference. And I hope that this event serves to demonstrate the benefit of the One Health approach and to inspire more interdisciplinary collaboration uh, to tackle disease risks in more preventive and holistic manner. So to come to an end on behalf of the BMZ, uh, thank you very much um, for your attendance to this uh, seminar and I wish you a very beautiful, fruitful exchange um, during this side event. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Eibach. We really appreciate your attendance today and the opening words. So, all right. Let's move on to the next point on our agenda. So, I'm going to give you a brief uh, overview of One Health and its role in the German government. Um, as uh, Dr. Eibach already pointed out, uh, we have quite a number of projects in this field. Oops, sorry. There we go. Uh, we have quite a number of projects running in this field. We have supported um, projects that have One Health relevance since 2016 with over 700 million euro. And in total, we currently have around uh, 56 running projects with One Health Relevance, which co cover a broad variety of topics, including stenosis, NTDs, AMR, pandemic prevention and response. And uh, they look at uh, aspects of collaboration, improved capacity building measures, and coordination between sectors, and better communication around these uh, issues. Um, as you can see on the map uh, on the left, they're located in quite a broad variety of countries and <coughs> mainly focusing on, on Africa so far. Um, the topics that are in focus in these projects also are of a broad variety. They include looking at climate change, at biodiversity loss, um, at food systems, at food safety and animal husbandry, and so on. So, as I said, as I mentioned earlier, I was going to introduce myself a little bit as well. My name is Nadia Winstermann. I work for the Sector Initiative on One Health. And this is not really the priority topic of this side event, but just for your information. We provide BMZ policy and technical advice on One Health. Um, we facilitate and support building networks and working with multilateral organizations and support implementing uh, knowledge management measures and new innovations. If you have any questions about our work, please feel free to come back to me after the session. But um, I wanted to look a little bit more closely at what actually One Health is, because I've, I've unfortunately heard only a few mentions of One Health at this <laughs> conference so far. Um, and I do think people have sort of heard about the concept and the approach, but not necessarily um, dealt with what it actually constitutes. So as Dr. Eibach mentioned, there was a, um, one Health High Level Expert Panel that was uh, put in place last year. And Olaf, in short, has produced a definition of One Health, which has really been helpful for all of the people working in this field because there was before that no unifying definition available. And everybody sort of set the boundaries of One Health a little bit broader, a little bit more narrow. Um, so Olaf considers One Health as a unifying and integrating, uh, integrated approach, which recognizes the health of humans, domestic, wild animals, plants, and the wider environment are closely linked. The approach mobilizes multiple sectors, disciplines, and communities, and works towards fostering well-being and tackling threats to health and uh, ecosystems. So it really also includes <laughs> looking at um, Water, energy, and air, saving just food, taking action on climate change, 
and contributing to its sustainable development. So Olaf also produced this pretty great infographic, which I really like because it highlights the need for incorporating social dimensions and research and academia um, mm -hmm. into the four C's where they can then uh, work together with inter intersectoral collaboration between disciplines uh, in the environmental, human and animal fields and work towards improving communication, collaboration, coordination and capacity building. All of this together leads into what we consider the One Health approach and, um, and our implementation of it. So this was not always the case. There previously was quite a bias towards public health and animal health interconnections, and the focus on the environmental dimension was always sort of technically appreciated, but in the implementation was really lacking. Um, traditionally, the focus has been on looking at food sa safety, control of somatic diseases, and AMR. But uh, this is changing, so it's really a positive development. In March 2022, the former tripartite, so the um, organizations FAO, uh, WHO, and formerly known as OIE, the World Animal Health Organization, expanded their collaboration on the International One Health Governance, governance to include the UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program, which has really brought about a new era of One Health that looks more closely at the environmental dimension and recognizes its importance. And I think this is also owed in large part to, to the COVID-19 pandemic, which was highlighted once again, that we cannot um, prevent diseases without incorporating the environmental aspects as well. So last week, I believe, at the World Health Summit in Berlin, um, at one of the events that we actually hosted, the Quadripartite published its joint plan of action for 2022 to 2026. And um, this is really a great document and I encourage you all to look at it because it has an incredible, uh, incredibly detailed um, plan towards implementing One Health from the international government side. Importantly, it also includes the action track six, focused okay. on integrating the environment into One Health. And why, and here it also notes that it's expanded its focus areas a little bit from the previous narrow definitions, looking at food safety, AMR, and synopsis. Now looking at uh, synoptic diseases with epidemic and pandemic potential, endemic infectious diseases of uh, synoptic and vector-borne origin, food and water safety hazards, AMR, and environment. So why is this relevant for the session here today? Um, the JPA has uh, a focus on water and several aspects of it, amongst which um, in the chapter on the health of the environment, we'll be quite, quite often mentioned quite often and highlighted quite often, looking at how water and soil pollution um, cause significant adverse health outcomes, looking also at AMR and its connection to environment and water, and then looking at um, unsafe water mm -hmm. for hygiene and for sanitation. It also is located under the point on food and water safety hazards, looking at water and foodborne disease outbreaks, and noting also importantly that this is relevant not only for human health, but also for animal health. So really again, tying that into this other aspect of plant health. Um, and of course, looking at the contamination of water, which it highlights is sometimes due to poor cross-sectoral management of waste. And um, on a bit of a negative note, it ends the chapter with pointing out that uh, the problem in, in this field are exacerbated by a poor One Health into integration into wash management efforts. So I think that this is really a call for a better and stronger cross-sectoral cross and intersectoral collaboration in this field. Um, and I think that today's event and the conference as such is a good starting point for this, these kind of efforts. And uh, there's certainly room for further collaboration. And I would hope that this is something that we work towards in the future. Um, I would also like to point out that there's a few new initiatives that are um, up and coming. So for example, there's the Financial Intermediary Fund um, Pandemic Preparedness and Response. 
uh, as well as the new Nature for Health Multipartner Trust Fund that is looking a little bit more on, on the preventative side of funding measures um, for, for this sort of field. All right, so that's it for me. That was just a brief introduction to the one half topic at large. Um, if you don't have any questions at the moment, I would suggest we look at the video and then we can discuss one half and its connections to wash a little bit further during the time. So it's easier said than done. Response initiative under the Green School Partnership Program. The main objective of this initiative is to support the safe reopening of schools in all the 33 wards of Lusaka District by implementing COVID-19 school operational guidelines and national legal instruments for prevention of COVID-19. We've gone around to check on the facilities of uh, hand washing. Uh, it's uh, quite uh, impressive to see that there are a number of uh, facilities, different types of facilities, and they are all functional. Chawama is a school in the Periharban of Lusaka, and it is one of the schools that is in a green partnership. Working together in partnership with different other partners within the city, and this is helping us to identify different uh, activities which are happening in schools so that we can provide the necessary uh, measures, uh, intervention measures in this case. When the, our partners introduced to us the group hand washing, we did not just sit back and uh, be comfortable with the two that were introduced. So for us to intensify the WASH programs in school, we have entered into the partnership program, which we are calling a Green School Partnership. We are here last year, uh, over a year ago now, and uh, we started the group hand washing uh, process from this particular school. So for that data that we collected, we discovered that each school each has got its own priorities and also the areas in which we can intervene as the partnership in Green School. Now with this group hand washing uh, uh, points, it has uh, you know, helped us that almost every child is able to wash at any time, before break, after break, as they are coming and everyone, we have dotted them everywhere. We have achieved a lot of cleanliness. We have achieved a lot of uh, uh, hand washing facilities. And the information which youths are using in order to understand the Safe Back to School campaign. All right. So I really like this because it, um, it shows that you can incorporate aspects of sustainability into WASH activities and there was sort of also an include the environmental sector and in our activities. But uh, enough from me, I would like to invite Dr. Benzaria to give us a little bit more insights about NTDs and the role of WASH and WASH in schools and how these all are, can be interlinked. Can you just try and get your presentation up on the screen a little bit more? <clears throat> Ah, yeah, okay. There we go. Good morning to everyone and uh, special thanks to GIZ and the organizers of the Water and Health Conference. It's my first time to attend this uh, great conference, uh, uh, meeting of the minds and the hearts, I think, you know, of different sectors. And, and, and wanting to hear more about NTDs and WASH, 
washing schools, and the possibility of the entry of one health in the schools, the two wins that is already existing. From the University of the Philippines, now we have a neglected tropical disease study group that brings us to communities and, and children and the schools, providing data evidence for our ministries of health and education, and sometimes to WHO, occasionally to UNICEF, but hoping that there would be more, more ties not to actually be able to influence policy and improve practice. So here's my proposed outline for this morning sharing learning exchange, as Dr. Ibach has said, and I'm, I'm happy to uh, share and, and respond to comments and questions in a bit. Neglected tropical diseases, they've been around for quite some time, and um, they're ancient. Unfinished business of so many generations, it's passed on to this generation now. We're not, we're not going to finish, and, and therefore we have to prepare the next generation of leaders who will actually help solve a lot of these things. Um, and, and, and the main thing actually that, that brings us together in NPDs is that they affect the poorest of the poor, diseases of poverty, and therefore they have less chances of getting better as a result of NPDs, and it's a vicious cycle. Um, we in the NPD community rejoiced you know, when this was included in the SDGs, you know, targeted for elimination of um, uh, some of these diseases, better control for several of these by 2030. Some round figures, there are 20 NPDs listed you know, in, in, the, in, in the top priorities. My former boss in the university, the chancellor said, June, Stop calling them neglected. That's why people are neglecting them. I said, I'm not the one responsible for calling them they're neglected. Blame WHO. I said, <laughs> all right, one billion and, 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 and a bit more there. And imagine also focusing on children, children afflicted with more than just one, two, or three of these all together, feasting on the same little bodies of our children. I'm a medical parasitologist you know, by training and, and practice. And therefore, I was uh, so um, interested to see that there are a majority of the items in the list are parasitic. You know, these are NPPs that should not be around. You know? um, and I coined it an acronym. When I teach, I like to teach the students things to remember. Three Ps, people, parasites, and poverty, they go together. Where you have parasites, now you have people in poverty. Where you have poverty, expect parasites. And I like to call the attention of this group to the three S's, another <laughs> group of S's. You have the big one, so transmitted helmet infections, which I will use later on to demonstrate you know, the possibility of more effective NPD control in the school setting. Um, schistosomiasis, unfortunately, this was not uh, included in, in Washington schools by fit, you know, because it's not nationwide. But when you look at uh, hard hit areas in Mindanao, Southern Philippines, infection rates are so high. Children are tiny. You know, they get out of school so early, uh, early in terms of dropouts. You know, you have uh, grade six grade students who look like they're in grade one or grade two, and they're absentee from school, they drop out. And in some cases, they die of schistosomiasis. Now, schisto is a waterborne infectious disease where the worm penetrates your skin and it ends up under your liver, multiplies there with so many eggs, destroying your liver. So in the early stage of illness, the children already have destroyed livers. And I, I worry about that a lot. It could be easily integrated with soil transmitted helmet infections. Both are addressed with mass treatment, but it has to be a cocktail, albendazole plus prasiquantel. But there's reluctance from the Ministry of Education to include it. Why? Because of a high incidence of side effects. And side effects are a sign that the drug is taking effect. Now, these are transient, mostly mild. If you need to manage them, they will go away. For as long as the drugs are taking effect, you see side effects. In fact, the side effects are a sign that the child is wormy. And therefore, this sort of communication uh, message has to be put across quite clearly. Then you have your third S there, scabies and ectoparasites. Now, these are the latest additions of WHO. Scabies, of course, caused by the scabies mite. And of course, a big one in, in, in tropical countries, including the Philippines, pediculosis, you know, head, head louse infestation. And when you, when you ask the Ministry of Health or Ministry of Education, there is no national program for control and prevention of head louse. So what do the mothers do? 
they pick on the on the heads of the children one by one, they will never finish. I always tell them good luck <laughs> because the, the ectoparasites multiply faster than the velocity of the picking <laughs> out of the of, of those things. All right. Um, and of course, there's interest from WHO to now integrate, you know, because they're also the same, same school children. Even my own child, when she was in third grade, not in private school, she went home with head louse infestation. My wife, who didn't understand head louse, so I said, oh, that's a disease of the poor. I said, no, you know, the, even those in private schools get it. And who, who, who were actually the sources of the head louse? The classmate and the nanny of the classmate coming from the province. So it's really, you know, it, it, it can have so, so big numbers when it actually there's new technology, it's ivermectin. No, I will make things together with the anti-worm drugs. So three SS could be easily wiped out, you know, controlled, not, not eradicated, but more effectively so that the children can concentrate better when they listen to the teacher. Rather than your heads are so itchy, you're always scratching, your tummy is aching, you have to be sent home, you know, or, or you feel sick, you're so weak, you cannot go to school. All right, so the big one. The biggest, I say, because most widely distributed geographically. And of course, it's most popular because it's most common. You know, round worms, whip worms, hook worms. Very recently, WHO added strongyloidiasis, my, you know, this is threadworm infection. And, and mainly because of one of the advocates in the STH advisory committee saying, strongyloidus, strongyloidus. It's also soil, soil transmitted. But it, of course, minor in terms of the impact on the children. But really, the big ones are roundworms, whipworms, and hookworms, all causing abdominal pain. Two of these notorious for causing anemia and growing children suffering from chronic anemia, devastating consequences. They don't grow tall and smart. You even have some brain difficulties, brain development difficulties. So, of course, wash plays a major role here. And in fact, when you have a lot of worms, that's a lot of wash. And therefore, we need more of wash so that we will have less of the worms. Um, worms keep on coming back, the infection. Mothers refuse treatment in the school. Oh, my child has been dewormed last year. The worms are already back as early as three to four months after treatment as a result of poor wash and access to wash. High risk groups, you have those children there, preschool and school age children. That's the reason why fit for school is a nice model. Bring worm control in the schools, worm control and prevention. We're not pairing so nicely with preschoolers. In the Philippines, only 30% of preschoolers attend daycare. So you have to run after the children in the communities, which is so difficult for health workers to do. So we need some innovation along that line, all right? Uh, and of course, women of childbearing age, among the neglected of this, of, of, of this uh, list of high-risk people, the women of childbearing age, especially the pregnant women, the wormy pregnant women actually give rise to low birth weight infants. And think that patients don't like low birth infants. When you have low birth weight, you have lots and lots of morbidities associated with it. And very neglected are the high risk occupations. I'll tell you a secret in the Philippines, very high prevalence of worms among soldiers. Mm -hmm. you know? And you know, I was so shocked, Mike, when we did our surveys in the military camps, the number one worm was hookworm. Hookworm is a blood sucker. Imagine blood suckers sucking blood from the soldiers. How can they defend you and me if the soldiers cannot defend themselves from the worms? And they're feeling weak and feeling sleepy as a result of the anemia caused by the worms. So neglect, this neglected disease, neglected high risk groups. And so the neglect happens you know, so many times. Okay, open the package one, of course, just a quick, quick note. The biggest of them all, uh, the most common worm in Southeast Asia is Ascaris. And you know, those eggs are so, so sturdy, they can last in the soil up to two years. Can you imagine? It's even, it's even the longer lasting than the, than the chicken eggs. No, there is hard boiled egg outside. You know, but the Ascaris eggs can survive for two years in the soil. So imagine open defecation happening there with children passing out so many worms. I will quantify the eggs in a short while. And I, I, I will take your imagination. These eggs are lasting up to two years. So you can imagine how clean an environment a child is, is in when there is so much open defecation happening there. Okay, the, the remote control, I think. Oh, okay, so they, they may have shifted because they put it here. 
Happy New Year. Yeah. Okay. All right. Is there a way I can point on the screen? I'm using the refresher, you mean? Yes, please. Um, I don't know. I think it's easier yeah. because I have. Time. I know, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't think so. I don't think you can be in this if the way that we have it set up and also be doing nothing. Sorry about that. Thank you very much. Okay, so it's not a case of a warm control, huh? Yeah. Okay, so thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. We're hoping more be case nasty or for this and all be prevented with, with master administration brought into the classroom, teacher assisted, and all. And of course, there are there are some gross complications that we don't like. No, and, and the complications come as a result of cheap real children not getting treated. There is still refusal for the warning, huh? even in areas like the Philippines, where fit for school has existed for the last 10 years. So many reasons why children uh, have mothers refusing for them to take the drugs. And, and when they refuse to take the drugs, then the worms can cause complications. We got, we got called in Mike one day by the children's hospital, uh, a severe abdominal pain in a 16-year-old girl, high school student, right upper quadrant pain. Lo and behold, there was an Ascaris worm stuck in the gallbladder. So that worm likes to wander around, it likes to go in and out of holes there in the small intestine. Sometimes it ends up uh, going out below or go coming out there above. Sometimes it goes out through the nostril. You know, nasty, nasty worm. It likes to wander. We call that uh, uh, erratic migration, uh, wanderlust is what we call it's what my teacher called it. All right, wanderlust. All right, and it ends up in the gallbladder. That's a result of that child not getting treated in school. When when the surgery is not needed, when you have actually done a good job, work control. And of course, uh, we, we all know malnutrition, poor school performance, and poor cognitive development, very unacceptable for the growing, growing child, and other states of poor health, and therefore we don't like the worst. But the solution, a package of watch. <laughs> and it cannot be just the warning alone. The warning and the warning alone, we will never finish. You know, until the end of the world, you're doing the warning. You have to be doing watch. And of course, it's a nice acronym because it's easy to remember Water, sanitation, hygiene, the warning. We were taught in med school, you do stool exam before treatment. That is no longer the case. We do preventive chemotherapy. Master administration, bring the drugs to the school, bring the drugs to the daycare. It's quite different to run after children in the communities. The use of antihelmintics, either alone or in combination, for morbidity control. You avoid complications. You avoid malnutrition. You avoid poor cognitive development and poor learning and other poor states of health. You do master administration. Get rid of the worms as fast as you can. And that is achieved by a master administration. Um, latest is that you know we're moving towards the possibility of combining the drugs. There is a worm called wheat worm that is a blood sucker that requires that, that, that might require now two drugs as a combination or cocktail, because ordinary albendazole, mebendazole doesn't do wiping out of the worms quite easily. So the, the, the trend now, and I saw the latest WHO guidelines, we're now, they're now exploring albendazole plus ivermectin on a mass scale. Early and regular mass drug administration reduces occurrence, extent, severity, and long-term consequences of morbidity. And to a certain extent, it contributes to minimizing transmission to the, to the environment. Okay, so this is the world map showing you the hot spots where, where preventive chemotherapy is still needed. We, we did that do quite well, uh, not reaching the 2020 targets. Um, I, I think even, with, even without COVID-19, we would not have met those targets. But, if, but with COVID-19, it even pushed us down. And take a look at this, the performance is such that only something like less than 60% of children preschool and school age are, are, are getting regular treatment. And look at the number of countries. Now it's a so low 21 out of the target 75 countries doing the regular stuff. And of course, the regularity has even been affected by COVID-19. So, so many unmet targets in the, in the countries. And this is the performance across the different regions. Notice the, 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 the reductions uh, in, in 2020, 2021. And the school children are, are, have a bit of an advantage over the over the preschoolers because uh, for school children, it's, it's already now school-based. And as I said, there are challenges in the preschoolers. 
but we hope we can we can get some some more innovation happening among preschoolers so that when they get the first grade they're already winning over the worms versus they're losing they're losing uh, against the worms when they're preschool when they get to the first grade they're they're still wormy but you know the 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 havoc has been uh, done in the preschool uh, period um down more trend and and I, I i call now for some catch up mechanisms because COVID has pushed us further down, we need to get the countries to think about catch up. Catch up. No. Did you play snakes and ladders when you were little children? Yes. Okay, so we were already somewhere there and we were bitten by the snake. And down we go. A long, long ladder. We need to catch up no? and roll the dice some more so that we can go up more quickly and reach the target. Okay, Philippines. I showed you regions of the world. Let's go Philippines now. And notice this is the last survey prior to the pandemic that shows variable prevalence or infection rates across the different regions. These are school age children, by the way. And you have still relatively high moderate to heavy intensities. We don't like moderate to heavy intensities of infection. These are children having too many eggs, sometimes too numerous to count. More eggs means more worms. More worms means greater morbidity, greater abdominal pain, greater malnutrition, poorer school performance. And so we don't like moderate heavy intensities of infection. According to WHO, all these should be less than 2%. Take a look at this, pretty high, 29 and 3%. It's, it should be overall less than 2%. Only four regions might are, are winning the war against the worms. So many regions are not winning the war against the worms. Majority of the regions still with moderate to high prevalence not meeting the WHO targets. All right. But the wonders of mass drug administration, I'm not talking about WASH yet, huh? Just mass drug administration, not so much of WASH, high coverage rate, at least 75 to 85% coverage rate, a prevalence of close to 80% goes down to less than 20%. That's the WHO target with moderate to heavy intensity infections close to the target of less than one to 2%. The wonders of mass drug administration. But how come the worms never go away completely because of reinfection? And thus, the war on worms cannot stand alone as a war against the worms. There has to be WASH. And therefore, we coin the acronym WOW WOW WASH. <laughs> no? War on worms, but you need to do WASH to actually get rid of the worms more completely. WOW WOW WASH. Um, wash sector coming. <clears throat> All right. When you bring in wash, and we were called in uh, post Typhoon Haiyan, this one of the strongest storms that hit the Philippines, Typhoon Haiyan, and so the the multilateral organization, so many funding agencies came and established zero authentication in many communities. So you have on the right zero open authentication villages, and on the left the non-zero open defecation villages. Worm prevalence, this would be heavy intensity infection. The heavy intensity infection is something like 1 million eggs per day being passed out in the feces of the children. 1 million eggs per day times 365 days. That's 365 million eggs that last up to two years in the soil from just one child that is not treated. The children, by the way, if they're treated, We'll have just like intensity infection as you see on the right side with zero open defecation. Notice the wonders of wow, wow, wash with zero open defecation. You don't see 1 million eggs per day anymore. And you have here just the infections, light, light intensities of infection. These are relatively new infections. The heavy intensity infections are old infections, and you have these children still ingesting the eggs or larvae still penetrating their bare foot. No, so the wonders of combining now the war on worms with high coverage rates and, and zero open defecation, showing you diminished morbidity considerably. And take a look at this. The stunting rates are also considerably lower now in an area like this, where sanitation has improved tremendously. And therefore, it's no longer enough to say, wow, wow, watch. I have to bring in nutrition. We now say, wow, and wash. One on worms, nutrition, water, sanitation, hygiene. So more players need to be brought in. Um, the call of the WHO revolves around keywords collaboration and integration. And Dr. Ibach was talking about that you know, over and over again this morning 
But I'd like to focus on the emphasis on ensuring effective wash strategies to prevent resurgence. And the wash has to be sustained. Um, we went, I, I did not include the data set anymore, but in Masbate and Bicol region, one of the poorest regions, where they said they have zero open defecation. We take a look at preschool, preschool age children, infection rates and intensities were very high. And we explained that in the paper as they reverted back to non-zero open defecation status. So the maintenance of ZOD, I think, has to be factored in, not very important. And lastly, coordinating effectively with other ministries, and, and this has been uh, spelled out earlier by Dr. Iba. Uh, financing, just like your new game plan, though we will need that, and, and, and countries leading the way. And of course, we are in the war now, warned by the vets. And this is the nice thing about the inter, interdisciplinary collaboration. The vets have warned us. You keep on using the same deworming drugs. We've done that in the animals. The parasites are developing resistance to the drugs. So therefore, there has to be monitoring. And WHO is infusing some support for monitoring drug resistance. We're monitoring it might in the University of the Philippines, where we are checking on the efficacy of the drugs that have been used over the last 10 years. No? OK, and of course, you know already the importance of WASH. We have the WASH-related morbidities, but I want to emphasize a number of these are affecting our, our little children. You, know, you have the diarrheal disease and the common worms are transmitted helminths. Malnutrition, of course, is a given. You have schistosomiasis, but you know the prioritization is that high because the Philippine authorities say, ah, it's not nationwide. So I don't want to wait for it to become nationwide before we give some attention. It cuts down, it shortens the lifespan of the kids. No? And it actually gets them out of school early, not dropping out from school early. I think it has to be combined with morbidity control for soil transmitted there. means, of course, Philippines is hot spot for dengue. We can actually bring all these programs preventive and promoted in the school setting. And in the Philippines, there's the washing schools. A nice, nice platform. Uh, Dr. Ibach said uh, this has received about uh, 10 years worth of support. Washing schools. I like the acronym because it's winning. It win, winning the war alone, winning against malnutrition, winning the war against the worms, etc. Implemented since 2016, the five key elements I think so relevant for this uh, conference and monitored through the three star approach. I think UNICEF has uh, supported that uh, for quite some time as well. Um, and of course, the possibility now of bringing in one help. You know, in the school setting through what has been established as wins. And I will, I, and I will propose pos a possible way forward in that regard. Thanks, Nadja, for updating the definitions. You know, and I think we will promote the new definition you know, to our, our uh, partners and stakeholders. We were asked by the GIZ to revisit the wins you know, early this year. And we saw wins as part of the school, but the school is part of the community. In the community, there is community wash led by the health sector. But in the school sector, you have the you have the school sector leading the wins. Although the school is within the community, when you look at data sets and monitoring and all, they do it separately. And I'll show you the evidence in a short while. Remember also that aside from wash in the communities, there are disease control programs happening in the community, being implemented in the community. Occasionally, some of the programs are able to penetrate the school, like in wins, you have the warming inside, so there's warm control. All right, we're, we're calling the attention that the wash in schools should contribute to overall wash in the community that should over that overall should contribute to disease control and ultimately result in improved health and learning outcomes. So what I'm proposing is what not wash for wash sake, but we want to bring wash to show results in the area of disease control and hopefully to show results in the area of improved health and learning outcomes. Similar to that 10-year monitoring, we're using morbidity control. No? Or, or the, I think the better example was the WOW and WASH, where zero open defecation has shown just almost no moderate to heavy intensity infection and low, low, low prevalence of light intensity infection. And why is this? School-based health interventions, such as those delivered by the WINS program, may contribute to community wash because the school is part of the community. And other health programs, because the school is part of the community. Using the One Health lens now, you know, like a microscope, use One Health, 
which considers how human health is interlinked with animal and environmental health, eco ecology, as Nadja just mentioned earlier. The WINS program you know, can be revisited to identify strengths, challenges, opportunities, possible links with community washing disease control programs. With the results now being able to provide evidence for enhancement of policy and practice service delivery, leading to enhanced disease control that should be seen as you know reductions in 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 terms of rate and all oral health even improved nutrition ultimately contributing to improved health and learning outcomes. So just a glimpse of the report that we submitted to GICER. We were trying to bridge wins with community wash this is control and health outcomes, integrating WINS with the health sector because there is a certain disconnect. You know, the WINS is doing its job quite nicely in the school, but the, the health sector does not notice it so much. So in terms of what are you contributing to the bigger whole and through the One Health approach. And of course, special thanks to our Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, and the GI set for allowing us to do this. So just a glimpse of some of the findings Increasing percentage of schools with at least one star in most study sites, reflecting continuing improvements of access to WASH, WINS program implementation, I think it's a good job. We compared two regions, we compared two regions close up view, Western Visayas having higher percentage of schools with at least one star compared to the Karaga region. So there are regions that are left behind. We need to provide support for such regions. Wins and community wash programs target similar sets of health, health outcomes, but there is a lack of correlation. Wins and the wash somewhat disconnected. We have to bring them closer to each other. There is a need for better inter interoperability of school and health databases, standardizing definition and harmonized data sets, joint policy implementation monitoring, probably similar to JMP. Could there be some, something like this, a joint JMP also at the country level? Uh, enabling regular assessment of wins and community wash programs and their effects on disease control. Okay, increasing wins ratings for sanitation services is correlated with decreasing incidence of their disease. Check. And we're proposing the as because the real disease, intestinal parasitosis, and environmental and their dysfunction are among the underlying causes of malnutrition that are directly or indirectly linked to unclean water, inadequate sanitation, and poor hygiene practices. We're proposing nutrition as an indicator in the Philippines in terms of health outcomes. Look, the Philippines data is not so favorable yet. Now, if we're among the highest in the region. You know, and so we have to work on this. But of course, wins and community wash and disease control should all contribute to this. Uh, potential of integration of animal health strategies in the Philippines, we still have increasing numbers of dog bites and increasing rabies deaths, especially among school children. Although the numbers are low, the numbers are rising. So it doesn't speak about rabies elimination. You talk to the rabies elimination guys in the Ministry of Health, oh, we're talking about the last mile. This is the longest mile, I said. No, we're not reaching <laughs> the last mile. It's taking so long, and you still have increasing numbers of dog bites and increasing numbers of rabies deaths. And you know, of course, rabies is 100% case fatality. Not in the school. In school, children are at high risk. Let's bring rabies elimination, prevention, and promotion in the schools. Uh, and then we utilize the existing formats, platforms. There's there's already a lot of interagency collaboration. We don't want another one health uh, platform, but let's utilize. Now they're already existing in various levels. One health riding on the, these existing platforms. Uh, as in all very good programs, sustainability is key. Financing in the Philippines, we capitalize on Universal Healthcare Act. Financing is a major part of it. Where wash, the warming, vaccination services could be part of population health services that actually government funds. Okay, and 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 lastly, lastly, I hope you're not fed out with the worms. The NPDs, common worms, poor wash resulting in unacceptable morbidity in children, malnutrition, poor school performance, and poor states of health. We need more of WASH so that we will have less of NPDs. Water, sanitation, hygiene, and warming in winds. Schools as public health units. I think that is, that is the nice thing about Fit for School. They utilize the schools as public health units where we can do WASH interventions and disease prevention and control. Let's expand those disease, and con disease control and prevention services in the schools so that we can save more children. Contributing to community WASH, 
contributing to overall disease control in the community, and contributing to improving health and learning outcomes. And lastly, I think schools are an excellent value for the One Health approach. Children should be made to understand early enough the interaction of human, animal, environmental health and ecology. I want to call it WINS Plus now. I don't want to erase WINS. We call it WINS Plus, a package of interventions, including provision of safe wash facilities and warning, those are given, Promotion of good hygiene behaviors given, but let's add on some priority disease items there that are One Health related. Considering One Health areas of work and focus areas, I want to call it One Health Wins. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Delario. That was fantastic. And uh, you really are the master of acronyms. <laughs> All right, um, so just to show you a little bit of the work that's being done on worms in schools, uh, we have this really short video for you. Um, the thing that's different about a verbal vacation home, <laughs> you always have the whole... Infectious diseases intestinal worms, malnutrition, tooth decay. These are the most prevalent diseases among public school students in Lao PDR. The Fits for a School program aims to prevent these diseases by transforming schools into healthy learning environments and through simple and cost-effective interventions. Daily hand washing with soap, daily tooth brushing with fluoride, and biannual deworming. Regular hand washing with soap is the most cost-effective way to stop the spread of diseases. Research shows that it can reduce the rate of diarrhea by nearly half and respiratory illnesses such as flu and pneumonia by one-third. Statistics show that brushing teeth regularly with fluoride toothpaste is the most effective way to prevent tooth decay, reducing the number of new cavities by 50%. Functional washing facilities allow students to practice these essential hygiene habits on a daily basis. A washing facility accommodating several students at once can be made from locally available and affordable materials. Parents help to construct these facilities, which increases ownership. Schools are the best places to perform mass deworming because it takes only half an hour to deworm a class of 40 students. Schools are also excellent venues to educate parents and teachers about the benefits of mass deworming. The Fit for School approach integrates the National Deworming Program as part of a school's core health package. Clean school grounds and well-maintained toilets and washing facilities are preconditions for a healthy learning environment. By clearly defining the role of every member of the school community in ensuring that these conditions are met, the program promotes a culture of shared responsibility for the health and well-being of school children. Teachers supervise the activities. School children are encouraged to lead the group activities. Parents help to improve the school environment. ค่ะพระเจ้าอ่ะนะเป็นครูสอนประจําห้องปู่ห้าเนาะหลังจากเข้าได้คําแนะนําจากอํานวยการเนาะว่าเฮียอ่ะเกี่ยวกับการปฏ
40% less tooth and mouth infections, and 50% less heavy worm infections compared to schools employing traditional health education. Research is currently being undertaken in Lao PDR, and it is expected to show similar improvements on children's health. The Ministry of Education and Sport, Lao PDR, in collaboration with the Ministry of Health, has been successfully implementing the Fit for School program since 2011. Experiences from model schools were consolidated to develop tools and guidelines that will support the program's expansion. As this simple, cost-effective school health program leads to significant improvements in children's health and subsequently educational attainments, the Ministry of Education is planning to further scale up the Fit for School program and is encouraging partners to support this endeavor. Okay, so now I think we're mm -hmm. on to our next agenda point. Christy, thank you so much for agreeing to present a little bit on the persistent gaps and challenges here today. And we look forward to your Thank you. Um, and I'm presenting on behalf of the whole JFP team, including Aisha Dunvis from the UNICEF side. So if you have any difficult questions, please direct them to her. <laughs> You'll get a better answer. Okay, let's see if I can figure out. Huh? Fantastic. All right, um, just a quick reminder that Washington Schools is in the SDGs very explicitly. Uh, and the indicator definitions you see on the screen for drinking water, there's water available, it's from an improved source, uh, for sanitation, there are improved toilets, they're single sex, and they're usable, they're available, they're functional, and they're private. And then maybe most of most relevant to NTVs, but I could argue all of these are, of course, would be hygiene. And for the SDGs, this indicator is that there's water and soap available at a hand washing facility at the school. So we recognize that these are necessary for controlling NTDs, but of course they're not sufficient. I really like the wow, I'll wash, um, but this idea of having, this is a precondition and a complement to other interventions. Uh, as we talk about collaboration and trying to improve collaboration between sectors, and I think there was some uh, talk already about sort of integrating monitoring or um, collaborating on monitoring a bit more, I wanted to highlight that in order to monitor those three SDGs for Washington schools, it just takes seven basic questions. And the idea here is to try and keep it very simple, something that can be harmonized across countries, and these questions and some additional details are available in this document that's accessible through that QR code. A little background on the JMP. We are responsible for monitoring the watch related SDGs. Uh, so that's target 6.1.1 and 6.1.2, but also uh, Washington schools targets, which UNESCO UIS is the custodian agency for. We support those efforts and help with definitions around the WASH side. So we produce estimates every two years for Washington schools, and we just released the latest data update this year. So we're very excited about that. You can access it through that QR code. There's also, I think, a few more hard copies out in the lobby. And for this, we had over a thousand data sets that went into our estimates. This is probably um, the main figure that folks are interested in is, are we on track to meet the SDGs for Washington schools? And we are not. Um, we need a 14 times improvement in the rate of progress for drinking water in schools, three times for sanitation, and five times for hygiene. And we're starting really low with hygiene, um, especially. So in 2021, we estimate that 58% of schools had just hand washing facility with water and soap available. So as we're talking about control of NTDs, um, that's particularly concerning. This graph just shows the different SDG regions and then coverage for water, sanitation, and hygiene. 
And I just kind of want to highlight, you know, see for some regions such as Australia, New Zealand, which is literally Australia and New Zealand, uh, it's 100% coverage. If you look at Europe and Northern America, we have every country over 60%. But then down at the bottom with Sub Saharan Africa and Northern Africa and Western Asia, you start to see a really wide range of coverage. And I imagine that, you know, as we go to the bottom left quadrant of this graph, this is also where we have a lot of focus on deworming programs and NTD issues. Uh, and thanks to Aicha for doing the complicated analysis behind this. Uh, but not only is water, sanitation, and hygiene on their own the necessary component of controlling NTDs, but of course we need all three of these together at a minimum. And when we analyze the proportion of schools that have all three elements, we see a pretty significant decrease. So maybe here I'll highlight Ecuador, 77% uh, of schools had basic drinking water, 59% had basic sanitation, and 51% had basic hygiene. But when we look at all three of them together, that drops to 22% of schools. So less than a quarter of these schools have these very basic necessary elements to controlling NTDs. Um, so not only are those you know, necessary, but not sufficient, uh, but we recognize that the definitions for basic washing schools don't include all of the human rights to water and sanitation. So there's additional things that might be monitored at the national level. We call these advanced services and encourage countries to add additional things um, that could include additional indicators that have more relevance to NTD prevention. So I wanted to kind of throw a question out to the audience to think about, you know, what should we be prioritizing as a wash sector that could help us um, further the NTG agenda? And I'll kind of give some examples of some of those in graphs here in a little bit. Uh, but I wanted to highlight really quick that there's some suggested expanded questions in that document that I provided the QR code for earlier that support some of these advanced monitoring indicators. So kind of running through these as examples of what countries are already monitoring that might have a lot of significance for NTG control. NTD control is, um, here's from the three-star approach. So very cool to see that earlier. Um, you can see if we look at the location of hand-washing facilities, in places that would encourage hand washing at key moments, so before eating and after using the toilet, uh, we can increase in coverage of facilities and schools in the Philippines for primary and secondary schools at both the toilet and the canteens. Uh, in Sudan, they have collected data on uh, hygiene promotion and health messaging. And so you can see that a lot of schools include health method messages uh, during morning assemblies and over half include health messages as part of their core curriculum. And then 16% have a special lesson exclusively on hygiene. So really trying to drive home particular messages. And then there's 11% that do global hand washing day activities. So just an example of how we might be able to monitor and track progress in getting these messages out to school children. As an example from Gabon just last year, they included an assessment of um, environmental cleaning materials that were available in schools. And you know, on the very far right there, you can see that 16% of schools had no materials for keeping a clean and hygienic environment, which is concerning for NTDs. I think I just presented this yesterday if you're in the Washington Schools session, but I wanted to highlight it again today. Um, you know, if we talk about basic sanitation, that doesn't include toilet cleanliness. And so I really wanted to highlight this as a potential important indicator. And there are some countries that are already looking at how clean are the toilets in schools and what's the cleaning frequency. And then the last example here is looking at solid waste management. Um, and just kind of highlighting how schools are managing solid waste in different ways. And some of these may have impacts on NTDs as well. So 
So um, as we talk about collaboration and trying to integrate and harmonize monitoring and work together to try and share data, I wanted to provide a QR code to this Excel document. It's basically all of the core and expanded questions plus um, some data analysis support that might be helpful if we're trying to harmonize and um, integrate monitoring indicators in each other's systems. And I particularly want to highlight there's a tab called PPR, Pandemic Preparedness and Response, that has a lot of the NTD relevant indicators. So maybe leaving you with more questions than answers. Um, I've kind of highlighted the first one already, but what else should we be trying to promote as a JMP when we're talking to national governments about um, additional indicators or advanced indicators that could push the NTG agenda? NTD, I don't know why I'm struggling with that. It's, it's like STG, NTD, <laughs> NTD agenda further. Um, and then also, you know, are there ways that we could align JMP indicators and NTD data sets to support national and global monitoring of winds? How can we sort of align data sets, share data? And that's where I chose the expert, so please chat with her. And then are there additional opportunities to use WASH data to actually inform um, deworming programming, for example? So let's work together. <laughs> And that's all I have. Um, thank you so much for your time and your thanks for the teacher. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And I would encourage you to just stay up here oh. <laughs> because we'll move into the panel discussion. If you don't want to join us, we have 20 minutes left for some QA. Uh, I know we have around 50 participants online as well. But at the moment, I don't see any questions from our online participants. But if you are interested in communicating with the panelists, please do so using the Q&A function. Um, and otherwise, uh, I would ask you first, the participants in the room, if you have any direct questions you'd like to ask. Uh, yeah, and there's already quite a number of them. Do you know that before I could donate, uh, they don't have a mic? So the mic should pick them up, but um, yes. it's probably best to give them the mic if possible. Okay. Um, so, okay. Um, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for the great. Right there. <laughs> so, uh, Sure, that I that yeah, that room yeah. there should be good. You can project it. Yes. Oh, yeah. okay. you Thank you for the great presentation. Thank you for very interesting every part of it. Uh, my question goes to uh, from where we sit, we are calling a lot in schools in the rural and urban infrastructure toilets. Uh, but uh, we want, usually we find it dark that we don't know where it fits in because menstrual hygiene management ends at uh, materials. So we find a lot of compromising in the disposal in the toilet that are already constructed. I still can't figure out where the disposal bit comes in because if you say solid waste, it still gets lost. But uh, I've been in rural schools where I can see girls struggling with maggots coming out of the toilets because of the compromising of the sanitary parts that are not going to get in the toilet. So I think that should be prioritized in all the three points on where it, where it fits in and the three-star approach to schools. Thank you. Thank you. Our collective questions. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm Rayet from Stanford University. Thank you so much for your presentations. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, I'll try to be brief. So, uh, Dr. Belisario, I'm very happy to see we've moved on from just working on uh, mass drug administration and we're looking at the root cause. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's really great to hear that. Um, in the vein of parasites developing drug resistance, and uh, also along the lines of the, the previous question, I'm wondering whether we're thinking about um, how can we get rid of the eggs um, that are lasting you know, for, for two years and again um, are living in the latrines and could potentially develop, move on to developing um, uh, drug resistance. Are there any treatments that we have thought of that could help us address that uh, root cause of potential reinfection? And also um, to uh, colleagues from the JMP, 
Uh, I had a couple of questions related to, you know, what is clean? Uh, what do we mean by that? You know, it's like, do we have clean toilets? That, you know, it's great, but what's clean to me may not be clean to someone else and, and vice versa. And also the frequency of, of uh, cleaning the bathroom, doesn't that depend on how many people use it? Because, you know, if we clean once a day, but we have a lot of people using it, um, may not be enough and vice versa, if not many people are using it. Thank you. I think we'll connect one more question and then uh, we'll wait for them before we head on to the next question. Yeah, I have a question uh, also to you, um, but also to a uh, professor from the uh, from Philippines. Um, so one health means health of the humans, health of the animals and health of the environment. I hear a lot of talking about the health of humans and of course worms causing infections but are we talking about health animals as well and how do you keep your environment uh, in such a way that it's indeed uh, not affecting the health of the people at first place? so i was wondering what is your experience on that and also more maybe broader from a broader perspective what kind of interventions have you seen that are effective in this way of really in this holistic way of movement? I'll uh, go over to the panel to start with the first question, and then we'll collect a few more. Oh, <laughs> Do you want us to just go in a line? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> okay, um, to the MH disposal question, thank you for asking that. Uh, that gets overlooked so much. So there is an MH disposal question in the core questions document for the JMP. It's also in that Excel document. But it's really, we lack some validated questions around MH disposal. Um, there's a lot of work being done on that. So there's the Menstrual Health and Hygiene Global Monitoring Group. They recently put out a priority indicators document for um, suggesting what we should measure for girls' menstrual health and hygiene. And that has a little more detail on what maybe we could be measuring for MH disposal in schools. So I'd recommend that priority indicators for monitoring girls' menstrual health and hygiene document. Um, for the toilet cleanliness, what is clean and frequency, what does that mean? These are exactly why those are not included in the core definitions, despite a lot of pressure and knowing how important clean toilets are. A lot of people said clean toilets has to be in the SDG definition. And we're like, yes, but we don't know how to monitor that in a harmonized way. Um, that being said, that core questions document and the Excel document does have some suggested definitions to include in surveys, um, but things can vary so much. It's hard to harmonize people's definition of clean, as you mentioned. Uh, I think... Those were the main ones that the JMP could answer, but Aicha, do you have anything to add on that? Okay, great, but I'm gonna pass it to Dr. Belisario. Thank you, Christine. Thanks for the two questions that were related to my presentation. The first one was on the eggs in the environment. And of course, when the eggs are passed on to the environment, this is the realm of environmental health. But of course, we uh, biomedical folks can also help in that regard. Of course, there will be chemicals that can inactivate those eggs. Unfortunately, we've been taught now since med school that there's no cost-effective means that, it, that, that, uh, that is recommended you know, to get rid of those eggs in the environment. The way to go, short of the uh, resources needed you know, for chemical, chemical control, you know, that, that would be the term to be used, is to actually move towards zero open application. Because in one to two years, all those eggs will be gone for as long as you stop already zero open, uh, op open defecation. And the way to go in the biomedical side of things is you, you check the children now because what the children have, the community has. So when the children are close to worm free, maybe your ZOB is working. And maybe add one or two more years, there should be no more worms. Now when there's really complete zero open defecation. On the second, the concern on one health and animals and the worms. Yes, this is the realm of the veterinary public health folks. In fact, they were the ones who called their attention on the possible emergence of drug-resistant parasites. And so we're monitoring. We're, we're behind them. They're, they're, they're teaching us. In the realm of parasites and animals, you're correct. For as long as we're not addressing the parasites and animals, those parasites are going to cross over to involve humans. 
I, I did not include in my presentation because of the limited time. There is more crossing over of dog and cat cookworm in tropical countries moving on to infect people. And how do they do this? They do molecular techniques. Uh, they realize that the species that are found in the people are now parasites coming from the animals. Um, there is a lack of data in that regard. These are small, small studies, no, small cohorts, and therefore it doesn't make a huge mark on the federal public health community that we need to do something about this. No? And the way to go really is to generate the data so that we can convince now the higher ups to give special attention now to the animals that are wormy so that the worms don't cross over to the people more easily. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe just to add on uh, from my perspective, I think that it's traditionally been an issue that um, sort of positive net outcomes on the environmental and animal health side have not been prioritizing intervention. And I think that that's definitely something that we need to change and work towards uh, bettering. Uh, I saw a few examples of case studies presented here at the conference that utilize nature-based solutions for their work mm -hmm. and make sure that the interventions have a positive um, a way of, sort of reutilizing resources and making sure that they're, they're sustainable and have a positive impact on the environment they're um, implemented in. So these are really great stepping stones to, to, to make reduce this problem and the disease burden. <coughs> Right, I'll collect a few more questions, but then I also do want to hear from Mike a little bit more about the, uh, the three star approach because it was mentioned in both presentations and we haven't heard that much about it. So maybe two more questions. Uh, I think we had to kind of follow up. Um, I guess first, our response and the question. Um, so I work on One Health in Bangladesh and we work at chicken cooping. So that's one is like, keeping chickens outside the house at night. So that helps the people and helps the chickens um, because they can be in separated compartments so they're not like picking at each other, like right, things like that. Um, and also on pig tapeworms. And so um, uh, work in uh, Sichuan, China on pig tapeworms. So both these about vaccinating pigs essentially, but good for their health and people aren't getting infected with pig tapeworm. So I was wondering again, specifically about pig tapeworm um, and you know, it, it, um, the problem is that the worm goes up to your brain Right, and so it's not influenced the same way um, by other um, deworming drugs and things like that. And so I don't know about the prevalence in the Philippines, but I know there is some pink culture there. So I was wondering how that fits into your picture. Um, and then sort of um, as my colleague here mentioned, sort of thinking about food hygiene in schools too. Uh, he noted that wasn't on the chart, and a lot of schools are now serving school meals and things like that. And so how do we fit that into um, the many acronym for Washington School? <laughs> Um, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I'm Mabel from uh, Kenya and uh, on the hygiene part, you'll find out that uh, so sometimes there are jiggers uh, that in our school children. They are treated and they go back to the environment. And uh, you you find out that uh, sometimes it recovers. So what can we do more on the environment? These people are going back to so that we don't have those recurrences. That is a challenge that we are facing, and uh, we really need to do much more on this. Oh, hello, um, Rebecca Evans from Warwick Medical School. Uh, it's just a question uh, for the pre professor, please. Um, really about, um, you mentioned that there's a lot of resistance to um, the children uh, receiving drugs and, and you've got these mass drug administration campaigns. Uh, my question is really about um, ethics and consent and um, really the possibility of educating the families uh, in the schools. I think it's all something about it in labs but is the school a place to educate people and do you have to obtain consent and, and questions around whether you can mass um, uh, administer drugs and to what extent? Thank you. One last question and then we'll open up. Thanks for your So you mentioned uh, about sort of the concern about resistance to anti-hilarpic drugs. Um, and that we're going to be doing some monitoring in order to try to present, uh, prevent that. 
um, do we think that monitoring is enough to deal with this problem? Um, I know antihemetic resistance can be very different in how antibiotic resistance presents, but um, if can, are there lessons that we can take from kind of the scourge of global antibiotic resistance and how we deal with preventing uh, resistance to, to the anti women drugs? Okay, these are quite a broad set of questions. <laughs> we have very limited time left, uh, unfortunately. Um, but would anyone like to start? Professor <laughs> Bonzaya. Okay, I almost got overwhelmed. There are five items to respond to. Let, let us try quickly. Number one on the the pig tape form was right. That's first, right? Pig tape form. You saw that it, it's in the list of 20 items there. But you know the, the, the things on that list actually fight it out with each other, which one would be first. And in fact, I, I invented again another acronym. No? <laughs> NPDs. There is a subset there, I call them VNPD, very neglected. <laughs> the governments don't like to, to give a construct. And pig tape form is one of them. The proof of the neglect is lack of data. But you know, we see it in, 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 in the Philippines, people having seizures and cystic uh, uh, lesions in the brain on an MRI or CT scans. That's probably pig tape form. And you have pigs roaming around just like you have roaming dogs. They have roaming pigs in the communities, now all exposed to the waste and all. And, and, and the pig paper really lacks data. And in fact, proof of the neglect, even on the WHO side of things, it's only now that they're going to try a protocol to identify risk of which communities will need to be first now, in terms of attention for pig tape form. So I think data is very important for pig, pig tape form. But there are tools now, to actually diagnose and treat. But we can prevent it also, public health. Second, on environmental health um, expertise, what are we doing in the area of, of environmental health? Unfortunately, I'm, I'm not an environmental health expert. I tap our environmental health colleagues in the other department. But initially, now the basic thing is to validate first the figures. You saw in that, in that slide, oh, the report is something like 90%, but the real thing is only 60%. So there has to be some, some validation of sorts of reported data. Sometimes you give, you, you're given a false sense of security. We're okay, it's already 90%, but the truth of the matter is 60%. And, and, and of course, the intricacies of environmental health, I will leave to the environmental health folks. Uh, but certainly we need to continue to discuss with them you know, to find the best means possible to deal with environmental health concerns. Food hygiene fits in nicely with WINS, washing schools, food hygiene. Basics of you know what food to eat, how to eat. In Philippines, there is a eating of raw or half cooked food, or food of fish, or meat dipped in vinegar. When the meat becomes white, they think it's cooked, and there are parasites there. And sometimes the parasites are deadly, as in the fish parasites. So food hygiene fits so nicely in washing schools. Anti-parasite uh, drug resistance. Yes, we monitor both field and lab. And we also do a, a laboratory arm where we send specimens to Belgium, University of Ghent. They're experts there for looking for the genes that carry the resistance. But on the side, WHO proposes drug development. Unfortunately, it's not a uh, very lucrative because it's poor people wanting to get those drugs. So drug development, there, there needs to be some philanthropy there and drug combinations also to delay the development of drug resistance. MDA ethics, yes, the Ministry of Education actually gets consent from parents. If they don't have consent, children are not going to be deworming. But it's unfortunate they miss out on the opportunity. Sometimes it's fake news that wins over you know, the, the technology that you bring around. So health communications will be key to have a high consent rate. But yes, we respect the, the, the decisions of parents in the area of ethics and consent. Over. Thank you so much. Uh, I would really like to do my one last time uh, to, to my. I thought you had a question for him. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I, we have you sitting here on the panel because you bring so much experience with you about the collaboration between UNICEF and uh, work on WASH in Washington School and also the TSA approach. And I'm really curious about if you can give us a brief, brief, brief intro about what TSA is and how it can be combined with One Health and where you see the potential for collaboration in the future. Thank, thank, thank you. Um, so when I was asked to actually speak up here, I, was like, I don't think I'm in the position to be able to kind of sit in this, in this space. Um, as, as I've been listening to 
to to the presentations, but also with my discussions with you, Nadja. I think um, first of all, I think the three star approach was um, um, in itself um, something that was born out of Washington schools, um, which actually started from something called an essential healthcare package that was being promoted well before 2016 or well before when when the, the government of the Philippines took up um, took up Washington schools as a Department of Education effort. Mm -hmm. It started back with Fit for School and, and, and the original effort with, with GIZ. But even before that, you know, it was years of advocacy um, to the Department of Education to take on water sanitation and hygiene that we couldn't get through. Um, and it was actually H, you know, H1N1 <laughs> that triggered that, that effort back in 2008 when uh, the government of the Philippines um, said, look, um, we have this thing, all departments are supposed to do something um, and everyone needs to kind of figure it out. Um, and the Department of Education looked to GIZ and to UNISA inside the technical working group and said, what are we gonna do? And I think that was when we brought out what was in our back pocket and said, well, there's Washington schools. We didn't call it Washington schools back then. Um, since then, I mean, it was in incremental change. So it, it it's, you know, I've, I've left the Philippines program seven years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to see how much it's evolved and, and progressed um, is, is fantastic. And, and kind of like my reflections here is like, you know, we've had, we've had challenges of integration, right? Until today, we still struggle with convincing the departments of education to take on Washington schools because it beats out other priorities, classrooms, teachers, the priorities that they have to achieve. Um, when we speak to the Department of um, um, Health with regards to you know, ending open defecation, um, we struggle because there's immunization, there's um, rabies, there's, um, you know, all the, you know, when we work with health workers to do monitoring of open defecation and CLTS, we struggle because they have to monitor 49 other vertical programs in, in the field. Um, so I, as you guys heard, I'm a medical doctor, by training. I, I, I started in the Department of Health. I ended up in nutrition because Oh, I started, I ended up in, in, in public health because my patients kept coming back into the hospital. I ended up in nutrition because severe acute malnutrition was a problem for the children that I was treating. I ended up in WASH because when I did my SMART surveys, I found out, you know, the reason they're coming back and relapsing is because they're living in conditions that were, were not proper environment. So I think, I think, um, and just to say that, like Professor Belisario was actually was was my teacher, <laughs> um, um, and 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 it's a funny thing um, because because the thing that I remember the most when he was teaching parasitology was was you know deworming will not work when you don't have toilets, um, and and actually that really impacted me a lot. Um, and and now I'm I'm, I'm in Washington. When people hear that I'm a medical doctor, they just saw the reaction from Christy today. <laughs> I've known her for like eight years. <laughs> so so so, and I think my other reflection here is um, with regards to like Washington nutrition. Um, I'm, I'm glad to see Matt in the back because he's like super important with regards to um, the evidence around Washington schools but also because he's, he's been an important factor in, in promoting it and, and, and why it's the scale today. But he's also took a very important role when three trials came out a few years back with regards to kind of convening a sector um, um, with regards to how we see the results of the WASH benefits trials and, 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 and shine. Um, and then, you know, we as UNICEF got impacted a lot by that result um, in the sense that we didn't know how to move forward. Um, there, was a, there was a document that we co-released with WHO um, and you know, what the conclusion we were saying was like, you know, it, 
it, it echoes what Dr. Belisario was saying, you know, but you called it maintenance, we call it sustainability. Mm -hmm. You can, you can, you can, you can, you can have ending open defecation, but if you don't keep it that way, or if you don't make sure safe containment happens or safely managed across the chain, then you're throwing those worms back out into, in, 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 into the environment. Um, but what, I, what I'm also reflecting now is, is how important, you know, it's one, to not forget to link yourselves to the outcomes, the nutrition outcomes, the health outcomes. Um, and oftentimes when we create wash policy, we forget to do that. Um, and, and, and finally, I guess the thing that I, 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 you know, it's complex, right? It's complex to work together because each sector has its own accountabilities and, 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 you know, and I'm not only talking about the development world, when you trying to get multi-agency coordination within the government, you know, who's supposed to lead? Is it supposed to be the National Economic Development Authority? Who is it supposed to be? Um, but I think we've heard throughout the conference, you know, systems change. In your presentation, you've talked about financing and all the things to kind of get it to happen. We've talked about it in our game plan. And I think it's important, but we also need to be realistic with regards we will, will achieve within a short period of time. Um, it, it requires collaborative behaviors and that takes time and incremental change takes time. So, I mean, it, it, and, 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 and for us to be able to kind of achieve this, it should happen, but it, I mean, thank you to, to, to One Health for kind of just giving us a reminder of how important it is to actually collaborate. Um, and it's not gonna be easy, but um, yeah, hopefully this could be a start of something that's more, uh, I'll stop there. Thank you so much. And um, I apologize for running a little bit late and keeping you from your coffee. But I think this ends uh, the chat on a really positive note. Um, what's worth doing is sometimes difficult, but I'm sure we are uh, in a position to do so in a collaborative manner. Thank you all for attending and have a good break. <laughs>